We want to welcome you to Roundup, and as we begin this 2009 September 11th Roundup, would you stand with us as we present the colors? Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we The twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallant. If you would remain standing, and let's pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you welcome with me uh, Ted Roberts, our keynote speaker. Ted? Okay, we'll try it again. I really look forward to this evening. Man, I mean, uh, I usually don't go to men's conferences anymore. Uh, I did it for years. I don't go to men's conferences because guys get all pumped up and they go back down in the valley and they don't really change. And I have a promise from your leaders that they're really going to help you work out some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Because I'm going to be talking about issues that are so critical in your life, to say the least. Uh, you know, riding up here on my motorcycle, that was great. Man, that was great. What a great day, huh? Is that cool? I uh, remember doing a triathlon up here not too long ago. And uh, one of the things as you get a little bit older, you realize something. I realized in the walk portion, almost everyone in my age group was using a walker. <laughs> and, I, I realized also that, you know, I'm probably the most unlikely guy on the planet to ever end up to be a senior pastor. 
I pastored East Hill Church for 24 years, grew to around 7,000 people, mostly unchurched people, just had a ball. And I, I'm just struck by the fact how unlikely it is that I ever, ever ended up to be a senior pastor. Now, why would you say that? Well, watch the video screen, and I'll show you a view from my front office for over a decade. Old baby, yeah. Woo. That is the ultimate flesh trip, I'll tell you. Adrenaline personified. Now you're a fairly sharp group. You're probably asking yourself the obvious question: Why would anyone in their right mind ever leave a job like that? Answer: I ended up having to kill people at close range in Vietnam because I was a career Marine officer. And when I got there, they said we're losing more pilots than we are platoon commanders. Here's your rifle. There's your platoon. It was in the middle of a rocket attack. My wife sent me a love letter. She's a born-again Jew at the time. I was a committed pagan. Very committed. And she sent me a love letter in the middle of a rocket attack. I started reading, and I was half drunk. And I remember kneeling down, and I said, God, I've always believed in you. I don't know who this Jesus is, but sign me up. And that started the process. I finished a tour in Vietnam, came back as hard as a rock. And I tried to go to church, could not handle it. Obviously, I eventually got over that. I became a senior pastor. <laughs> but I remember sitting in the back of the church like you're in the back row, and I was sitting there listening to this guy, and I'm going, he didn't have a clue what I'm dealing with. I grew up with seven abusive stepfathers. My mother was an alcoholic, and I was an illegitimate child. Now, there are no illegitimate children. They're just illegitimate parents, that's all. And I came out of hell, and I'm sitting there listening to this guy talk about this ideal family and how they love each other. I'm going, I never saw that. I'm out of here. I can't handle church. It's a joke. Now, my wife, she's a great gal. She's not codependent on my problems, but she will not give up on me. And she said, "Hun, would you like to go to a Bible study? And I thought, okay. Because what I'd figured out, I didn't know much theology, but I figured out if I said yes to Jesus, I'd have read his love letters. That's what I've always called the Bible. So I said, sure, I'll go with you. Now, I have to paint the scene for you if I could. I'm a career Marine officer, all right? I polish my head with my shoes. <laughs> I'm going to a two-hour Bible study, all right? I walk in there, and it's an all-woman's Bible study place was a wash in estrogen. I mean, it was like slowly sitting on a tack for two hours. And the leader of the group, Dorcas, I'm going, Dorcas? These Christians are really weird naming their kids Dorcas. She had one eye this way and one eye this way, okay? And she, she said, would you like to close in prayer? And I said, sure. I never prayed in public in my life other than, help! That was it. And so they got real quiet, and they sucked their heads down, put their arms together. I'd never seen this behavior before. It looked like a herd of ostriches, okay? Now, I'm telling you why it's so unlikely I ever became a senior pastor. Here was my first public prayer. They got quiet, so I figured out it was time for me to pray. It was my first public prayer. Lord, whatever the hell you want us to do, we're ready. sucked all the air right out of that room. <laughs> Two little old ladies in the back passed out. I'm not exaggerating. Woo you know, there's... But Dorcas, she became our spiritual mom. She was a great gal. She tapped me on the knee. She said, that's the first time you've ever prayed in public, isn't it? <laughs> and they, How'd she ever know that? And then she pulled a sneaky on me. She said, would you like to know a prayer that God would always answer? And I said, sure. She said, just ask God there's anything in your life that he would like to change. I remember thinking at the time, great prayer, I don't need it. I was that screwed up. But I learned two things. Uh, number one, don't pray that prayer in public, especially in the military. That's a whole other teaching. 
The second thing, once I started praying that prayer, I discovered I was an alcoholic. I was a rageaholic. See, when you come back from combat and you've lost a lot of close friends, you're standing in a San Francisco airport, your dress uniform on, people walk by and spit on you, it makes you crazy. Thank God we're not doing that to our troops now. If you've got a problem with the war, spit on the politicians. Don't spit on the troops. I was an alcoholic, I was a rage addict, and I was a sex addict. I was totally out of control. And they were giving me medals for it. Once I finally started coming to church, I found a great pastor. I started realizing I was in spiritual war. And there's no taking no prisoners on this one. This is about eternity. It's not about dying on a battlefield. This is eternity. So I began to take the Word of God and devour it. I started looking for... You know, how, how do you fight this battle? I mean, I don't know if you realize it or not. You have a deadly adversary, and his, his purpose is to absolutely destroy you and devastate. If you're married, your marriage. It just He loves to do it and just wipe out your kids. That is his primary tactic. And so I began to look through the Word of God and eat it and devour it. And finally, I ran into a passage where I began to realize the strategy that God had laid out for us. If you have a Bible, you can turn to the last book of the Bible is a great book because it tells you we win. We win, okay? No matter what's going on in the world, we win. And John the Beloved lays out a strategy for all those who have said yes to Christ down through the ages for winning the battle against the enemy. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 10. If you don't have a Bible, I'll put it on the video screen for you. John the Beloved writes, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses him before our God day and night has been hurled down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury. Why? Because he knows his time is short. Now, when you're in a war, on the ground or in the air, you need to understand four things. You need to understand four things. Next slide, please. You need to understand your enemy's weapons and his strategy, and you need to understand your weapons that will counter his weapons and take out his strategy. You need to understand your enemy's weapons and his strategy, and your weapons and your strategy. Now, what I want to do is look at that passage of Scripture from a covenantal context and a historical context. Covenantal context, what do you mean? Old covenant, new covenant. That passage gives you a phenomenal insight into your adversary. In the Old Testament, you don't find much about your adversary. He's just seen in the shadows. Ezekiel 38 and others, he's behind the scenes pulling the levers of power. The, the term hasatan, I wish we wouldn't translate it into a proper name and make it into Satan. In the Hebrew, it means one who constantly accuses. And that is his strategy. But when you come to the New Testament, he is Satan, the devil, Diabolos, one who accuses falsely. Why? Because he can't accuse you before God because Christ has shed his blood for you and all of your sins, past, present, and future. Amen? Let's give him praise for that. Amen? Come on, let's shout to this guy. Thank you, Lord. But now put this passage in context. Who's writing it? John the Beloved. He's an old guy now. He's in his late 80s, we guess, which would be like 110 today. He's very old. He's poured his life over 50 years of ministry in Asia Minor, we call it present-day Turkey. Where is he at? He's on the little tiny island of Patmos. You can spit from one end to the other on it. I've been there. And he's breaking up rocks on the chain gang. The book of Revelation announces 250 years of devastating persecution against the church. Hundreds of thousands of believers were slaughtered, just butchered. Remember when I was in mainland China recently? <laughs> it's amazing. In this one area where we're at, you know what basic Christianity was there? Six months in jail. <laughs> I understood why these people prayed the way they did. They could really pray. I mean, we, we're in this tough situation. We are the most financially blessed nation in the world. You are the most financially group of people on the planet, overall average. That should not make you feel guilty, but it's a challenge. We have a different 
a different battle to fight. But where's John? He's on the island of Patmos, and, and what's going on? On a clear day, he can look across the Aegean Sea and see the smoke rising from the homes of all those people that he had mentored and poured his life into for over 50 years. They're all being slaughtered. So what's going on? The enemy's accusing. He can't accuse you before God, but I tell you this, if you're a man of God, I guarantee you he'll accuse God before you. It's exactly what happened to John. What good did it do for you to serve God? It's all being destroyed. See, God loves you enough that he'll allow things to occur on the job where the guy that doesn't give a rip about God, he'll get the promotion, he'll get the stab in the back. I know that's not the American gospel. I know the American gospel is you come to Jesus, you get a brand new car, trophy wife, and a split-level house. <laughs> you can only sell that baloney in America. You can travel anywhere else in the world, they'll laugh at you. See, God loves you enough to put you in those situations. Why? Because you need to come down to bare metal. You need to come down to bare metal. I serve Jesus Christ not for what I can get out of him, but because of who he is. Yeah. I, didn't get, I didn't get a lot of applause on that one. <laughs> but when you have a man who gets a hold of that, you can't buy or sell him. He'll have integrity down to the core of his being. That's the enemy's strategy, his accusation. His tactic? How many of you have discovered life isn't fair? Okay, the rest of you soon will at some point. <laughs> life is not fair. It's not fair. My kids were growing up, they go, it's not fair. I said, hello, life is not fair. I remember uh, we, we were having a church picnic and... Uh, well, the church was fairly large, so we, we were occupying a number of baseball fields, and I was out there trying to play baseball. I was gymnastics and wrestling. I couldn't play baseball, and it was horrible, and everybody was chuckling at the pastor being such a spaz. And the ball dribbled past me, and I'm, you know, and I'm sitting there a little bit uptight, and this guy comes running up to me, and he says, Pastor, your son's just been hit in the head with a baseball bat. I knew where Brian was. He was right over in this field over here. I dropped the glove, and I started running. You ever, you ever had one of these times where all of a sudden everything goes into slow motion? And the enemy's going, your son's dead. I only have one son. Your son's dead. I mean, those are the times where the enemy comes against you. The promises that God gives you, they're gone. And I think part of the reason I went through that is I counseled one gentleman whose son was hit in the head with a baseball bat. He laid in a coma for three months, and that dad had never told his son he loved him. Sir, if you're married, you have kids, you just wasted a day if you don't tell three people you love them. Number one is your God, number two is your wife, and number three, your kids. You just tanked a day. Well, my dad never did that. I didn't grow up. Well, get over it. Get healed. And I told my son continually that I loved him. And so I'm running towards him, and there's this little kind of group of people around him, and he's got a head wound, so blood everywhere. And, and, and I start to move him aside, and this little girl's holding her mom's hand over the side. She says, Mom, is he dead? And so I, I moved him aside, picked up Brian, and blood just all over the place. And all of a sudden, one eyeball came in, the other eyeball came in. He says, I don't think I'm dead, Dad. <laughs> so I, I picked him up and ran to the van, and we're taking him to the emergency emergency room and I watched my son I'm holding him and he's trying not to cry and he's in a lot of pain and I said son only weak men don't cry strong men cry they're comfortable with their emotions so now's the time where you just cry and you just pray in the spirit you just let God lead you and you just pour out your heart to God and so he's, he's starting to pray in the spirit and just crying out to God and I'm praying blowing snot the whole bit you know I'm holding <laughs> All of a sudden, I look down on my hands. I've got the blood of my son on my hands. Now, I don't know about you. With seven abusive stepfathers, for years, when I thought of God, I thought of one of those abusive stepfathers. I could handle Jesus, but Father God, I could never really get a grip on it. That moment changed it. Because my father did not send his son to an emergency room for me. He allowed his son to be butchered and chopped up for me. And I finally got it. I have a God that loves me scandalously, unbelievably. I remember we took him in the emergency room and they, 
didn't knock them out, and they're sewing them up. And I said, Doc, is there going to be a scar? He said, yeah, I think there will be. I said, great. And Brian goes, what? I said, son, we'll have a, a testimony. We'll have a witness of the victory that God gave us. See, every time the enemy takes a shot at you and doesn't play fair, if you yield to God, his hand will move in ways that are beyond human comprehension, and he'll turn it around to a trophy of grace for you and your family and your kids and everything that you touch. Amen? Amen. Let's give him praise for that, man. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Now let's look at our weapons. They overcame him by what? What? Blood of the lamb. I didn't grow up in church. I remember when I started coming to church. I thought, blood of the lamb. Man, this is weird slaughterhouse religion. And I remember there were two little old ladies in the front, you know, it was kind of a Pentecostal church, and they're going, woohoo, the blood of the lamb. They got these hankies, you know. I'm going, man, this is weird. I'm out of here. But you ever seen someone experience something in Christ, and you're going, I want that too. I don't want the hankies, but I want that too. That's what I felt. I said, God, could you explain that to me? Well, the next day I was uh, instructing a student in ACM, air combat maneuvering, dog fighting. And it's a long brief. It's an hour, an hour and a half and stuff. And I loved it, though, because, I mean, it's, it's like wrestling a chess match and just hand-to-hand -hand combat all at the same time. It's just intense beyond belief. And uh, so we're going out, we've got through the brief, we're going out, and I noticed the chase plane, because what you do is you have a guy fly a chase plane, you roll in on him, and you have to be in a designated area, because for some reason airliners don't like you dogfighting around them. They just get all uptight. You know, you lock on them, they freak out. Okay. Um. <laughs> so the guy plays, you know, he's chase plane, he's, he's, he's dumb, and you just roll in on him. And it was, it was Mel. I didn't realize that was a Navy squadron I was part of. I was a Marine pilot, and he was a Marine pilot, and we were in the same squadron in Nam, and we just dogfight at a drop of a hat. So I said to him, I was very mellow and laid back in those days, I said, Mel, I'm going to clean your clock. You understand that? I'm going to eat you for lunch. And I told the student, I said, forget the brief, just get a large barf bag and hang on. I'll show you what it's really like. <laughs> so we got in the area, and I, we just went nose to nose. Those were the days that dogfighting was like a knife fight in a telephone booth. Now it's like a video game, okay? So it was like, wham, right at one another. Canopy to canopy. We ripped by one another, and I knew what he'd do. He had a favorite maneuver. He'd roll wings level and snap into the vertical. And so I just matched it, roll wings level, snapped into the vertical. Now, when you're a fighter pilot, you actually wear a girdle. It wraps around your stomach, your legs, and some models your chest. It's called a G-suit. The object of the G-suit is to take your legs and squeeze it up into your helmet. Okay? <laughs> Because all the blood drains down to your legs, you pass out, you die. This is not good, okay? But it's, gra it's graduated on the level of Gs that you're pulling. So when I snapped into the vertical, it was probably about a 6G pull. It went to full 12 Gs in malfunction. So now I'm a helmet with two little feet underneath it, okay? <laughs> just, ah! We're going into the vertical. And he loses me in the center, runs out of energy, and so I let him fall through, and as he drops through, I stomp bottom right rudder, and it was like someone took a knife and just ripped it down my leg. Just intense pain. I went, ah! You know, and I disconnected and say, flight's over. Came back, had to talk to the flight surgeon when he canceled the flight. I told him about it. I said, how'd that happen? He said, well, it's real simple. You had such constriction for a long time. The lactic acid built up in your legs, and your blood system could not cleanse all the toxins that were in your body. Bingo, I got it. Remember the day before I'd ask God, would you please reveal to me the blood of Christ? 1 John 1, 7 and 8. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Wow, I got it. See, Christ didn't shed his blood for you one place. He shed it for you four places. The first place he shed it for you was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed so intensively for you that you would be here, that you would have the freedom to follow his grace that he sweat drops of blood. Now, I was an accident investigator also in the military, and it happens very rarely, but sometimes when a guy's going to buy the farm, he's going in, and he realizes that the sheer shock of it will cause his capillaries to fracture. Not the impact, but the terror of it. See, Jesus saw the cross coming. He didn't catch him by surprise. Adam cried out, not your will be done, but my will be done. Christ said, your will be done in my life. He saw the cross. He saw it coming. And 
The second place, you know, Mel Gibson really got it right. They, they took a crown of thorns, uh, the Roman soldiers did, and they smashed it down his head. You have to understand, that was a guerrilla war. When you're in a guerrilla war, you never get a clean shot at the enemy. You know, you got a friend that got the back of his head blown up by a sniper. Another guy stepped on a landmine, you know, and he's blown off his legs. So when you get a certified, a certified quote-unquote terrorist in the local population, then you're going to mess with them like a cat messes with a mouse. That's what they did. They took the crown of thorns and they just shoved it down his head. See, Jesus knows what it feels like to be caught in the games that people play. When you're on the job, someone's giving you the shaft, things are not going right. Christ knows what that's like. You don't have to power up. God put you there. If you're not in a job that God didn't put you there, you need to get in the job that God is going to put you in. Because you'll have those moments. And you need to know that Christ is in control. So you don't have to play the games that people play. And the place also where his blood was shed was on the whipping post. Isaiah, the prophet, 750 years before the time, looked down the corridors of history and he said, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, God uses me as a healing evangelist on church people. But if you think anyone understands healing, they don't. You get a book, The Seven Steps to Healing, they don't have a clue. I mean, it's amazing. You pray for this godly woman that just loves the Lord, nothing. You pray for this snotty guy that you like to kick him about 30 feet, God heals him. I've long ago just quit trying to figure it out. A friend of mine in cemetery, seminary, pardon me, he, he, he really had to figure it figured out. I'm sitting in his class, and I could not believe it. It's the most amazing thing. One of the first seminary classes I went to. I'm sitting there, and this professor is taking the gospel of John and making it boring. You have to have multiple PhDs to be able to do that. (laughs) And I'm sitting there, bored out of my mind, and my new friend rolls up, Larry Rossiter, he's in his wheelchair. He's paralyzed from the neck down, got one arm that works. And he pulls up beside him, kind of watching him. All of a sudden, he had a neurological reaction where his legs are flying all over the place, like someone in combat that gets a gut shot. His legs are flying all over the place. And I watched to see what happened. I was the oldest guy in the class. I knew what would happen. All the young guys looked away because they don't like to not be in control. Larry reaches over with his one good hand, puts both the legs back in the wheelchair. He sensed I was watching, and he looks over at me and goes, praise God. I went, wow, this guy's a player. <laughs> this guy is a player. And we became fast friends, and I love how Larry preached. He'd hook his one good arm around his wheelchair and just let her rip. And then here's the part I love. He'd always do this at the end. He'd say, anyone that needs healing, come on down. I want to pray for you. <laughs> He's in a wheelchair. He's only got one arm that works. And I love what Larry said. He said, hey, listen, when we pass through the pearly gates, we walk into healing. And I'm leaving this stupid thing behind someday. Maybe your day today, okay? Let's find out what God wants to do. He understood it well. And Christ shed his blood for you on the cross. Colossians chapter 2. Paul uses this phenomenal illustration. He says the slate was wiped clean. He uses a very technical term. It's, a, it's, it's where you clean a parchment of such character and such quality. In other words, you're such a skilled craftsman that you do it and it leaves no residue whatsoever. It says if nothing had ever been written on that slate. See, in hell there was posted all the stuff you'd done in the dark you hope no one ever finds out about. That's how the demons can hit you. They can't read your mind, but they can see what was there. And the blood of Christ wiped all of that clean so you can stand with authority against the forces of hell. Amen? Amen? Amen. See, yeah. God is always dealing with us in light of our destiny, not our difficulties. Now, what's the point for this? Was I was an alcoholic, a rageaholic, and a sex addict. At every single point where I needed help, God's blood had been shed for me. I could do the will of God because of Christ's blood. I could walk into healing. I could walk and not play all the games that my crazy family taught me to play. And all the sins that I've been involved in were wiped clean. I had a clear shot at becoming the man that I really cried to be. Because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by their, what? Word of their testimony. Well, that's kind of obvious. John is saying to those 
folks who are going to be facing Caesar's official, and all they did is said, come forward and, you know, just take a little bit of incense and put it on the altar, and you can worship Christ too, but also worship Caesar. John says, don't you sell out cheap. This life is just the title page to eternity. You're going to be out of here so quick. Most of us looking at you, you're going to be out of here 30, 40 years. You're gone. Don't sell out cheap. Don't play the games of this world. Now, for them, it's kind of, it's kind of obvious. I mean, they were facing death. We, you know, we're in, a, we're in a tough situation. We're blessed. Well, what's he talking about? Well, can I tell one more flying story? Can I tell one more flying story? I got two guys. That's all I need. Okay. Before I got out, I had to plan this flight very, very carefully because if they catch you, it's not like Top Gun, you know, when you buzz something, when they just slap you on the hands. If they catch you buzzing something, okay, flying low illegally, you become permanent shovel officer behind the elephants. I mean, that's what happens to you. That's where you get assigned. So I, I had to take off very carefully. Came down the Monterey coast, accelerated, accelerated just below the speed of sound, turned by Morro Bay Rock, went up this canyon that I knew like the back of my hand. You see, I had taken four years of college and crammed it into six, And I promised myself someday I was going to come back and do this. And I had the sun to my back so no one could read my bureau number. And I went right between the third and fourth floor of the administration building. Wham! And the aileron rolled out there, baby. Just smoking, baby. Woohoo! Yeah. This is my college. And I went back and landed. Nothing happened. I covered my tracks. It was great. About a month later... The operations officer says, Captain Roberts, I'd like to speak to you for a few moments. I thought, great. You know, I thought he was going to compliment me on all the great work I'm doing. This is going to be cool. <laughs> and he looked at me with these laser eyes. The guy had laser eyes. He said, I'm going to ask you one question. You need to think very carefully about your answer. I thought, this does not look good. <laughs> this does not look good. And he looked at me and just glared. I mean, like burned two holes in me. He said, did you buzz your college last month? I'm standing at attention, rigid attention, and I'm going, there's no way he knows. He's just blowing smoke. He's trying to get me out. I mean, this guy has got my career in his hands. I went, no. There's something much deeper going on here. What kind of man am I going to be? Am I going to lie to cover my butt? Am I going to do that? I just said yes to Christ. Now, am I willing to pay the price? To be a follower. And you have to understand, that was all I ever lived for was to fly. So I'm standing there and I went, Yes, sir, I did. And so I'm waiting for the high off, you know, the samurai. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm standing there just, you know, about probably about three seconds. It seemed like three hours. I wasn't sweating, it was squirting out of me. <laughs> and the commander looked at me and he said, Don't do it again. Oh, 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 oh. It took me, I think it took me about five or six months to finally figure out what really took place there. That was a male authority figure who could have really wiped me out. Every male authority figure that I had in my life had wiped me out. Jesus was doing what only he could do. He was reaching down in my soul and started to bring healing. But it takes integrity. I have a question for you. How many of you are married? Wow, my goodness. That ring that you have on your left hand, how you doing on that commitment? Wow, good. Okay. You realize that 66% uh, of American males who are on the internet, view a porno site at least once a month. That means 50% of the guys sitting, at least 50% of guys sitting in churches across the United States this Sunday will be getting more porn per month than they do the Word of God. 58% of pastors are sexual addicts. I just did a clinical study for Rick Warren's website. I discovered 58% of the people there that have subscribed to that, that responded to my questions, were sexual addicts, 24% of the women were. The primary users are internet porn. You know who they are? 12 to 17-year-olds. 40% of women now on the internet are in cyber sex activities. It's fast as going. 
our world in America is being eaten alive. Whenever I travel, we're going to Holland again, Amsterdam. It's one of the few places I go and I have to apologize for being American. Now, why would I apologize to be an American? We produce 90% of the pornography in the worldwide. I've never spoken before a large men's group in the last five years where I just get to talk to the men. I'm not going to do this with you tonight. And I ask them, how many of you are really struggling with this? How many of you can look God in the face and say, I'm walking really clean? 70 to 90% of the men in churches stand, acknowledge it. A part of the problem is what we're doing at churches doesn't work. It doesn't help you. Trying harder doesn't work. I mean, I've counseled people now. I'm a certified sexual addiction therapist. And one-third of what I do is I specifically counsel pastors because they have nowhere to go. They're trapped. And, and it's just, it's just it eating the church alive. And so I'm not going to ask everybody to come forward and acknowledge you're struggling with this and we're all going to try harder. We're never going to do it again. That doesn't work. One of the things that's going to be developed this week and will continue into the months ahead is there'll be groups in your churches that will help you get free. Because we can never have a revival in the United States of America if we don't deal with this issue. God would have to repent to give us a revival. And we will have no impact in our world until we help guys, I said help guys, not shame them, not condemn them, not say you need to try harder, there's something wrong with you. Help them get to health. Once we have the men in the church really be able to get health, they will have not only purity in their life, not by trying harder, but it'll flow. They'll have a great marriage. And their kids, the generational curse will not be passed on to their children. So this is a battle that we need to face. So that's why I pose the question. I'm not pressing it any further. I will later on. I'm not going to have, you're not going to have to be afraid that I'm going to have everybody come forward and everybody's going to see you. I'm not going to do that. But what I'm going to do is give you some tools that will help you. You see, the word of our testimony is what just really devastates the enemy. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved their lives, what? Not to the point of death. What is that? Is it someone going, ah, I'll die for God? We've got people flying into buildings for their God. Is that what we're talking about? You know, there's something you need to understand about the early church. Here's how they went to their death. Bless the name of the Lord. They've taken my wife and my children away. They're going to kill them. They're going to kill me too. But blessed be the name of my God. I will follow him all the days of my life. That's the way they died. Now, I don't know about you. How, how do people pull that off? How does that happen? That's something I wrestled with for years as I followed Christ. How does it happen? It doesn't happen by trying hard. It doesn't happen by being real religious. There's something here that I missed for a long time. And I finally caught it. I finally caught it. I'll close with this. Let me tell you one of the greatest miracles in the New Testament. It's in John chapter 21. You don't need to turn there. Peter goes fishing. He goes fishing all night long, and he catches what? Nothing. I, I've translated the Greek Testament how many times? The guy never caught one fish without Christ's help. Hey, Pete, they're over here. He was the world's worst fisherman. And what I can't figure out, his buddies went with him. You read the text. They went with the fish, and the guy never catches anything. So they're out fishing all night. They catch nothing. They come back, and there's this figure on the, on the shoreline that calls out to Hey, and we know it's Jesus, but they didn't know that. And he asks this question. Did you guys catch anything? One of the greatest miracles in the New Testament. Peter goes, no, a bunch of fishermen telling the truth. <laughs> Go figure, man. That's God. I mean, fishermen make golfers look honest, okay? And then, and then, you know, Jesus fixes breakfast for him. I want to see the video replay on that one. But th there's this discussion, you know, do you really love me? And, and P goes, well, I really like you. Jesus says, do you love me? Well, I really like you. Well, do you love me? Now, you can really do anything here with the Greek you want to. It's like statistics. You can bend them in any way you want to. But what drives me nuts is you read some commentators and they'll say, well, he's reminding Peter that he failed him three times. That's not God. That's a demon. I don't know who your God is, but man, you've got a demon on your back. 
And then some other commentators will go like, well, um, he's helping Peter to understand that he loves Christ. That's good. But it doesn't even come close to what's actually taking place there. This is what's so powerful. Let me use an illustration as I close. How many of, uh, uh, my wife's Jewish, so I have to watch this movie every year. I mean, it's mandatory watching. Filler on the Roof, anyone ever seen that one? Yeah. If you haven't seen it, it's a great, great movie. If you haven't seen it, here's the, here's the, here's the plot. It's just real simple. Uh, this guy's a Jewish dairy farmer in Russia. Bolshevik Revolution. Communists are taking over the country. He's going to be forced out. His one cow breaks down. His horse doesn't work. And he has two daughters. Both daughters come to him that day and tell him they're going to marry these whacked out guys. This is a bad day for a dad. Doesn't get much worse. So he goes into the little hovel of a house he has. He comes up behind his wife, Golda. And he says, do you love me? She's Jewish, okay? She's going, Jewish, do, 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 do I love you? Are you, are you crazy already? What are you, nuts? And he's going, well, maybe nuts, but do you love me? And you, you see the camera closes in and the wheels are turning. And she's going, 25 years. 25 years of the same bed. 25 years of struggles, 25 years of victory. Yeah, I think I love you. And he's like a little boy. He goes, you love me, you love me. <laughs> you know? And then here's the scene. Okay, this is the scene. And they both look at the camera and they sit down on the edge of the bed. And tears are streaming down their face. And they go, after 25 years, it's kind of a cheesy musical too, okay? And so after 25 years, it's nice to know you love me. No, it's not just nice to know you love me. It takes something that was a contract marriage and turns it into something that's so powerful, so profound, you can't even express it with words. Now hold that thought. Jesus leans over to Peter and he says, do you love me, Pete? Gentlemen, who's the vulnerable one? It's Jesus. The one who spoke in the cosmos came into me. In light of that love, what are our options? Yeah, you can tell God to stick in his ear, but I don't think so. In light of that love, what are our options? It makes us passionate for his purposes in our life. Let's pray together. I've run out of time, so I'll be very short. Let me just ask a simple question. Have you said yes to this magnificent Jesus yet? Maybe you've always seen God as a traffic cop ready to write you a stinking ticket. But Jesus took the rap for you. He took the hit for you. Maybe church has just kind of driven you crazy and someone kind of drug you here. Don't confuse church with Jesus. Sometimes they're not even in the same ballpark because Christians sometimes are such hurting people, they hurt other people. In light of his love for you, don't you think it's time? I mean, you came all the way up here. Don't you think it's time to say yes to his love? Or maybe you did and you got beat up along the way. As I said, church people could do that to you. And you just kind of pull back. Isn't it time kind of to start this weekend off where you come all the way home? Where you come home to the Father and his great love and his grace? Well, wherever you are in that spectrum, either coming to the decision point of saying yes to Christ for the first time, or you're coming all the way home, I want to pray a very simple prayer over you. But I need to know who I'm praying with. So as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you, if you're making that decision tonight, either for the first time or you're coming all the way home, I'm going to ask you to be bold enough to raise your head and raise your hand, catch my attention as I look around the audience. Starting on my right, your left. You're making that decision just catch my attention. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay? In the center section? Yeah. Over on the left? Okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. Snow mom and apple pie. You're making a decision either for the first time or you're coming all the way home and all the way over here to the left. Yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. Father, we're raising our hands not to a man, but to God. And what we're saying is, Jesus, would you captivate us with your love? Would you draw us near? And we acknowledge that you hung on a bloody cross 
You took the hit for us so that we don't have to live under the guilt of what we've done in the past. And you rose again so that through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a capability, not our own, but yours, for us to become the kind of men that we really cry for. Father, this is our simple, powerful, poignant prayer. Jesus Christ, be the Lord of my life from this night forward on into eternity. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's lift an applause offering unto the Lord.